today we have before us a big question. Uh, and it's, it's being called uh, in philosophy the problem of evil. And that is basically, if God is good, why is there pain and suffering? There's, there's been many, many authors have written about this for many years. However, it's an interesting topic because it seems that the answers get forgotten. And there's been some answers that are really poor, that don't, are not really satisfying. And, and over time, I think uh, there's also been a, a really good uh, collection of writings about this. Uh, one of the great writings about this topic is called The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. If you want just one book to, to help you uh, go deeper into this topic. But one of the problems addressing it, uh, especially for us Christians, is that it has many facets. And you can look at it from many angles. You can look at it from the point of view of philosophy, so without bringing kind of scripture or revelation. And then there's what, what scripture says and what theology says. And there's, there's, there might be another way of addressing that. And even those two by themselves might not be really alone so great because they're kind of heady answers. And a lot of times when we are addressing this particular problem in our lives, it's not really about having the right you know, argument and the right response, but about uh, my spiritual life and how do I relate to God. And, 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 and I think this is uh, today's kind of idea is to have uh, an answer from different angles because it's also true that while we need an answer that we can pray with, so this, uh, we need the substance as well as kind of the, we need the heart as well as the, as the head. So we'll try to kind of bring them together. A little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a Jesuit, <laughs> but uh, my philosophy studies, this was my, my area of focus. So at the end of philosophy, you do three years, and at the end of that, you write a thesis, and you basically pick a topic in philosophy and write about it. And this was the topic I picked. I realized very much during that defense of the thesis that whatever answer I had back then was kind of incomplete. Uh, but then I was sent to theology, and, and that kept me, the fact that I had written about that uh, kept me interested. And I'm also a spiritual director, and I think that's kind of how these three I have found come together very well. So you start with philosophy, theology, and, and ultimately spirituality, which is how do I pray about this. That's the way I learned it, but I think perhaps the best way for us to discuss it is going to be to start from, uh, from theology, because I think a lot of times that's kind of a place where we already know scripture, we already know some things. So it's easier to start there, and, and there might be questions that we have related to that particular topic more directly. Then we can go into the bigger topic of philosophy, and because it will fill in some spots, and then we can go into spirituality. And my idea, will be to try to cover uh, the first two, theology and philosophy, in this first section, and then uh, give you a prayer exercise, something you can go pray with, so that when we talk about spirituality, that's something that you already kind of experience and pray with, and, and then from there, we can even bring some more questions. So if God is good, why is there pain and suffering? We can begin uh, with, with uh, theology, and if we start there, I think a very important thing to catch is that theology, uh, or like revelation, scripture, has uh, a path that has been through, and it's a path that, that is, of God didn't begin showing who God is to humans by telling them, there is a thing called the Trinity, and here's the creed. How does God begin revealing himself to human beings? Well, he goes to a man who was worshiping uh, other gods, 
and he was in a, in a land with many gods, and he says, hey, I want to make a deal with you. I want to be your god. Uh, let me tell you about myself. Come, join me in the mountain. And he goes, and, and the whole thing begins there. And it's very broad strokes, because God needs to show, show Abraham that, that he's worth his time, that he's like, that, that he's God. And the way God begins is like, you see how you worship those gods? I'm like that. So the way God says that is, uh, come, bring your child, and we'll do a child sacrifice like you're used to. And you're like, what? But then once it's up in the mountain, God says, I'm like those gods, but I'm different. I don't like that. I don't want murder. I don't want child sacrifice. So we can see like God beginning to introduce himself is so, so broad strokes. And, and it's a development where little by little, God continues to, to show more of who he is. So I'm like that, but different. I'm like that, but different. You can see a, a, a tremendous development you know, in the tradition. It's very progressive. So for example, God's distance and closeness, when, when it begins, is God only talks to certain prophets. But as, as time goes on, it seems that God really cares about these people. And he, he will go all the way to liberating them from the Pharaoh, you know? And then feeding them, you know, when they're afraid that they're, they're not gonna have food. And then, so God cares for them. And then finally we get Jesus, who is like really, really close. And he says, call God Father. So you can see there's a development of tradition. And it's progressive. So the first is that Revelation is progressive. So if you go very and read very old books in the Old Testament, you're going to get really bad answers about the problem of evil. So that's the first thing. The second is that the scripture, this is Catholic, uh, you know, uh, tradition, that scripture has two authors. All scripture has two authors. And it's the divine author and the human author. So when we read any particular book of the Bible, there's going to be things in there that are the revelation of God, God showing himself who he is. And there's going to be kind of the people, the human authors that are writing it, they're bringing in their own. You know? So sometimes you get very strange things in Revelation that are very much part of the human author. So they bring in their culture. They bring, for example, their culture of war. You know, and they'll apply a lot of that, what they, they know from war and from a, uh, violence, and they'll bring it to bear on God. Like, you know, so God is vengeful sometimes. How do you know which one is which? Because the, the, the divine author is constant, you know, so it's gonna be a progressive, a constant uh, development of certain topics. And the human authors, you know, they're gonna be all over the place depending on, on, their, on their takes on things. So, but when we look at the whole, we can see, ah, there was this human, this divine author behind all that. So those two things are important. And for what we wanna think about is what is the biblical stance before evil? So, how does the Bible talk about evil? Why would God allow evil to happen? You know, how does the Bible talk about this? And, and when we look early in the tradition, in scripture, we're gonna find that God punishes. So evil happens because God is punishing a human being. What they were trying to say with that is, there's a sense of justice. God is just. So that piece is true. Uh, but the way they were trying to think about it was like, it has to happen during this time. And, and so this thing of God punishing, uh, we see it kind of in the oldest parts of the Old Testament. So God punishes Adam and Eve. Now everybody suffers. Now everybody bears children. As suffering is the result of that. You know, so wow, wow. there you go. Well, that's... That was very early in the tradition. God punished Cain for killing Abel, right? 
he kills his brother, now you're gonna be marked uh, for, for life. Uh, God punishes the Pharaoh. So he enslaved the, 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 the people of God and God punishes him. God even punishes the Jewish people for not listening to God, to Moses. So that God is just, but does God punish? I think if we get into that, that's not where the tradition remains. You know, that it's only found in those old parts of the Old Testament. That's not really how Jesus addresses uh, evil, for example. And, and even within the Old Testament, there's a whole section of the Old Testament that really says that answer is very incomplete. We don't really think God is like that. So then comes another part of the tradition. In the Old Testament, you get a sense that God doesn't really cause it. God just allows it. So that's a different, that's very different. So in the book of Job, you see that this answer that, that the human authors had come up with uh, is not really great. Job himself makes that answer uh, because Job turns out he's a good guy. He's a just man. He's followed God his whole life. He's dedicated himself to God. And all of a sudden, everything's going uh, wrong. So when people come to him, his friends, they tell him, well, what did you do? They have the mindset God punishes. Yeah. What did you do? Because God must be punishing you. And he says, I honestly, I don't think I've done anything. <laughs> I'm really honest, but I don't think I've done anything. And in that book, there's not a real answer uh, for the problem of evil, other than it like brings a, a wrench into the, into the problem of evil. And it's, there's a couple of things that come out of there. For example, it says, God didn't cause this. God allowed it to happen. Somehow, the evil spirit that does it, in this case, you know? So, so somehow, God, the, the devil goes, he's, he's, he's a just man, he says, well, let's test them. And, and God says, uh, well, allow it. God didn't cause it. God just kind of allows it. And, and this is going to be part of, a, of, of the answer that God doesn't really want evil. God allows it to happen. And it might be because of some greater good from it. In fact, at the end of the book of Job, the answer from that book is God's ways are not our ways. God's justice is kind of escapes us sometimes. So if he allowed it, he must have had a reason. We might not know what it is, but uh, God's, God's ways are not our ways. So it's a sense of mystery, satisfactory. When somebody goes to read the book of Job and they think this is gonna be my answer, the answer is like, where were you when I created the earth and the, and the sun and the moon and the stations and the people? Where were you? Like, don't, don't, you have no idea what I'm doing. You're left with like, well, I was looking for an answer. I guess it's not, it's not, not, not great. There's other elements in, uh, in the Old Testament that also kind of get at it. Uh, and when we talk about the philosophy of it, we'll see why that's important. There's also a lot in the Old Testament that God is constantly calling us to, to seek justice and the common good. Basically, because that is addressing kind of like the evil that comes from our actions. You know, God doesn't want sin, you know. So at least in the Old Testament, we get, we get a sense that God doesn't want all the pain and suffering that we get from the sin of others, you know, from the destruction that we create for ourselves and the destructions that others create in our life because of the sin against me. God doesn't want any of that. In fact, God wants us to fight it, you know, to go against it. So God wants a world that is just, so, uh, and he wants us to contribute with goodness and love. God wants us to create a good world. And something that's very clear is that God's love is unconditional. So uh, there's a couple of scripture passages that are very important. In Isaiah, for example, it says, Israel has said, uh, God has forsaken me. And the answer is, 
Uh, in Israel, a lot of times it's people of God, so it's us. You have said God has forsaken me. And God's response is, can a mother forget her breastfeeding child? And it says, even if she were to forget him, I will not forget you. You are always, your name is always before my eyes. I have you, I have your name tattooed in the palm of my hand. So as that, is, that is to say, I'm always thinking about it. So if, if I have you tattooed in the palm of my hand is, if I go to open the door, I think of the person I, you know, if I go to grab something, I think of, if I go to anything, to the bathroom, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, God, God has an unconditional love for us, and so no matter what, this is part of the answer, God loves us. Um, so that's, that's very much from the prophets. And then we come to the fullness of revelation, and that is, with Jesus, you know? So very early pieces of the Old Testament, this God kind of, a, why does God allow evil in the world? Why is there evil in the world? Because God is punishing the evil to just justice, right? Later we see, well, that's not a good enough answer. How about uh, other evil? Well, God didn't send all evil. He just allows it, and, uh, but he loves us, and he wants a better world. And he wants us to change the world and make it better. You know? So that's kind of the way the answer goes. And finally, with Jesus, we have kind of probably the most important answer and, and that kind of brings it all together. And that is that Jesus accompanies our pain. God cares so much that he wants to walk with us. So we see from the birth, Jesus is born in difficulty, you know, he's born in a stable. He could have been born in a king's birth or something, but he's born in a stable with a lot of need. And that is gonna continue throughout his whole life, all the way to his crucifixion. And God could have stayed distant. God could have said, well, I'm not gonna get my hands dirty, but God cares about us so much, you know, that he became, becomes our, you know, and uh, it says, uh, it's Philippians, he who was in the form of God did not, so Jesus, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he lowered himself, taking the form of a servant and dying on the cross for us. So Jesus becomes familiar with our pain, becomes familiar because that is kind of what love does. So God cares about it, God shares it. And that is what love does. So uh, the incarnation, this, this kind of what I just said has, is the, the nature of love is, with we understand it in a very kind of uh, basic way, when we see uh, an adult, you know, facing, uh, their, their greatest kryptonite. You know what an adult's greatest kryptonite is? A child, you know? Because a weird thing happens, you know, when you, know, you see a lawyer, a doctor, uh, and they find a, a child, and all of a sudden they go, and you're like, what happened? Wasn't this an intelligent person? He had degrees and everything. But what happens is that that's what we do when we love someone. We, we come down to their level, we speak their language, you know, and that's what Christ did. So kind of what is God's position before suffering is not just uh, that he wants to eliminate, you know, sin. It's not just that God allows it for a greater purpose, but that God wants to share uh, that God cares for us, that God really loves us. And, um, and so, so a couple of uh, important passages here uh, would be the man born blind, that Jesus addresses this question directly from this place of love and, and care. And, and it says, they say to Jesus, 
was this man born blind because of his sin or because of the sin of his parents? You see, they're bringing the very old, Old Testament question. You know, why, why is he sick? It must have been that God punished him, you know? And if you're talking about God's mercy, then how come, you know? And Jesus' answer there says, uh, this man was not born blind because of his sin or because of the sin of his parents. So like directly, like, I didn't cause it. God doesn't cause it, you know? Uh, the answer there, he says, but that God's glory will be revealed. It's, a, it's an interesting answer, you know. This is not, this did not happen because of his sin, because of his sin, but so that God's glory will be revealed. And so it's somewhat like Jesus is saying, I'm not gonna give you a big explanation about disease. You know, there might be genetics, and we'll talk about that now with philosophy. But, you know, there's gonna be good answers as to why disease happen. But the first thing God wants to say is like, I don't cause it. I, maybe I allow it because of some, some other good thing. But, uh, but you know what? That doesn't have the last word. You know, sin, disease, evil in general, or problems, they don't rule. You know? And so this is kind of what um, others have talked about as uh, that uh, evil has a very temporary nature, and, and, uh, and it might have a, a role and part of a bigger thing. Uh, but kind of Jesus says, I can use even that, even the, the disease and even the problems that have happened uh, for, to show my glory. So it's almost like God might allow certain things to happen, but they won't have the last word because he's going to make his glory shine. In Romans, you know, that all, all things function for the, for the good of those who follow the Lord. But in general, it is a sense that no evil can defend. No evil is greater than God's power. So no matter what it is, it might be a disease, it might be uh, uh, something that other people cause because of sin, whatever it is, God can make that and turn it into something from earth. It's a very difficult thing to talk about, especially when somebody has recently experienced a painful situation, a loss. That might not be exactly, that might be the opposite of what we want to hear in that moment. So it's not how you want to bring it to when you talk to anybody. That's why this theology, not, not, not uh, spirituality yet. But, uh, but the truth is, there isn't anything that God couldn't turn it around and make it for his glory. So uh, I think you can think of disease, congenital diseases. Uh, I have a, a nephew that uh, when my my sister-in-law and my brother uh, got news. They were told that he had a congenital disease. You know, he had a trisomy and his, so he has uh, Down syndrome. And they said, that kid is just gonna be suffering. You know, suffering for him is gonna be suffering for you. He might die within the first few days. His heart is gonna come up with problems. His stomach is gonna come up with problems. And, and we, we cried a lot, you know, we, we, we shared this pain together. And, and now, you know, this little kid is the joy of the family. You know, he's 10 years old. He went through an operation, open heart surgery and a stomach surgery. And, and the guy's a survivor, you know, he has the most beautiful picture with this like huge scar in his chest and two boxing, you know, and it's just the, the joy of the family. My life is way more complete because he's in the world, you know. This kid, the way he hugs me, the way, you know, I make him fly, you know, there's nothing else. But at the time, it, it was like this, this terrible thing, you know. I, I have an uncle who, who, um, who was uh, kidnapped, 
and, and he, he's a lawyer and he helped a, an elderly woman who was, somebody was taking her house from the car. And he said, well, that's a simple lawsuit. We can do this human rights violation. Boom, he brought it in. He, you know, the old lady kept her house. And to punish him, they tortured him. It was horrible. Yeah. And they did horrible things to him. And in the aftermath of that, I thought, my dad will never be OK. He'll carry this his damaged goods. He got damaged forever. He thought that on himself. And you know, five years later, 10 years later, <laughs> he talks about that as an experience of God, that God was with him in that. And when they were torturing him, he started singing, and he knew they were doing it because he was an agent of God, you know, and they could take his life away, but the resurrection was going to happen, so they couldn't really do anything to him. And, and um, in the moment, he was very damaged by it, but there was a whole lot of a community that came around and showed him a lot of love, and there's been a lot of healing, and, and, and that uncle has become a great agent of light because that happened. He has a perspective on things. But you know, sometimes relatives that start fighting for stupid, petty things, he sat him down and be like, look, you know what I've been through. What you're going through is petty. Yeah. <laughs> Life is so short. You know, I wish I could have reconciled with so many people when I was going through this. Why don't we just put it aside? Yeah. So in the moment, it seemed like, oh, this awful, terrible thing. No, nothing good can come of this. It has. You know, God's glory has shown. In the moment, it was unexplainable. Why? So it's the same question. Is, why is God sending this congenital disease? Why would God allow this awful you know, sin against my uncle? You know, he was a just man like Job. Why? And, and the answer of Jesus is, it's not because of his sin. It's not because of the sin of his parents. But God's glory will shine through it so that God's glory will shine through. It's not that God sends it, God allows it, but somehow God can use even that. And finally, I think a, a very important passage, of course we have the whole life of Jesus from his birth to his cross, that Jesus says to us that he wants to share in our pain. You know, he wants, to, he doesn't, uh, let us go through it from the distance, but he wants to share it. So his position before um, our pain is not one of distance, but one of closeness. That God can make something good out of that. And a very important uh, passage for that is the shortest verse in scripture is two words, is Jesus wept. And this happens around uh, a, a moment of loss. So Martha and Mary, and that's Kind of what my invitation will be today for you to pray with. Uh, and that is uh, Martha and Mary lost their brother. And they thought that Jesus could stop it because they were friends. So they had a good pal, They're good people, a just people. Yeah. And, and Jesus doesn't make it on time. In fact, it's four days late. And uh, there's a couple of very important things in that passage. The first is that Martha and Mary um, are very honest with Jesus about it, and Jesus doesn't correct them. You know, Jesus kind of like embraces that honesty. So Jesus likes that honesty. And after they both say what they have to say, basically, if you had been here, this would not have happened. You know, Jesus doesn't go immediately and try to fix it. He stays with them. With each of them, has a conversation, and he stays with them. And and, uh, and at the end of being with both of them, it says, and seeing that, that Mary was weeping, it says Jesus was very deeply moved, and Jesus wept. So Jesus kind of uh, shares it so much that he himself kind of weeps for her. And it's, it's right there, like, if you continue that passage, it's like how, how much Jesus was misunderstood. People think, oh, he's weeping because of Lazarus. But he was weeping because of her. That's what scripture says. Yeah. So it's that uh, Jesus cares about our law. We could kind of put those kind of from theology that uh, evil, we could say, evil doesn't have the last word, but God can use anything 
for our benefit. And, and the other one is that evil has a temporary nature. So no matter what we may experience that is painful or difficult or that we might call evil, uh, it will pass because the resurrection uh, goes beyond that. So there's an invitation to put our gaze a little bit past those moments and actually see them from a different perspective. Like even the death of Lazarus seems very final, you know. Our losses, a disease seems very final, you know. And it might be that God heals us, it might be that God doesn't, but that will not have the last word. God's glory can be revealed even, even if, 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 if my nephew doesn't get healed, but he can't get healed from, <laughs> from a, a Down syndrome, God's glory has already been revealed in that. So sometimes even during our lives, but even if we were to die, that wouldn't have the last word because there is a resurrection. So evil has a temporary nature and, uh, and it doesn't have the last word. So I think we've gotten to the kind of the edge of, kind of some of the theology's responses. And now I'm gonna to try to give you a rapid fire answer from philosophy because I'm pretty sure that even after this answers, there's still some saucy questions. So it's like Jesus didn't give us a full answer. Like, what did, why did he allow uh, the seas then? He doesn't say it. He doesn't say it explicitly. He just says, I'm going to accompany it. But why? Why? Right? Or like, couldn't God have created a world where, where there wasn't sin? Like, Maybe just like, don't put the tree for Adam and Eve, and just don't do it. <laughs> and uh, so these are questions of philosophy. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's get into them. Okay. So from theology, the reason this, the, the answers might not uh, feel, feel complete is because theology is trying to answer a different question. Theology is answering, what is God's position before evil? So. And that we said, and that's, that's a good answer for that question, you know? God doesn't want sin, God allows it for some reason, but he has better, for something, it must be something good, and God accompanies it. So that's God's position, you know? That's how God, so between God and evil, but we have other questions. The questions from philosophy are, but why, but why, but why? So in, in summary, there's two parts to the answer because when, as you have noticed probably, just the two examples that I gave of my nephew and my uncle, they're definitely very, very different. So one you could say has to do, uh, you could call it, in philosophy, it's in philosophy they call it moral evil. So moral evil is the stuff that people do that shouldn't, people shouldn't be doing, so sin, right? So moral evil comes from our freedom. And that's this distinct from what philosophies have, philosophers have called, we'll talk about it in a moment. And the other one uh, is natural evil. So natural evil would be things like uh, a disease, a loss, my grandmother died, my, my father died, my my child, uh, that, that seems to alter the order of things. A child, no parent should bury their children, right? Uh, disease, so, uh, and, and they're distinct because one of them we, is really full evil because when we think of evil, uh, we need to define what it is, right? That's, this is all philosophy. That's, uh, that's, so if, if I find this thing on the floor, I can't say that this thing is, you know, evil. Even if I trip with it and I, and I kill myself. <laughs> like, this wouldn't be evil, right? The only way something like, like this could be evil is if, like, if it grew arms, right? <laughs> and then it tried to kill me, right? <laughs> then this would be evil, but uh, like an inanimate object can't be evil. So why do we speak about evil in that way? Because for evil to be so, 
it needs to have an intention, right? So, so disease, death, loss, technically, we really couldn't call it evil in that sense. Uh, so it's an important distinction because when people call that natural evil, well, because the fact that it's natural, there's no, there's no uh, intention behind it. So then the problem, unless it was God, you see? But from theology, we've been saying, God is saying, no, no, I don't want to, I don't send it, right? So if it was God, then it would be natural evil. So God sending whoosh, the, the storm, right? God sending the disease, but the, it would be. But uh, because there's no intention to, to things like disease, so how does disease work? Well, it's not like God is looking at the genetics and see like, oh, let's put an extra X. <laughs> no, God created a world with its own laws that we can understand, and it's got, you know, rules that, you know, and, and the same process that allowed us to develop as full human being is the same process that every once in a while gets off. It's the process of mutations, right? So every once in a while, a little mutation that be allowed us to become full human beings and have great muscles and, and nostrils, <laughs> every once in a while gets blocked and like somebody might be born without a nostril. <laughs> but that just uh, is not an intention behind it. So these are two different things because we would have to answer for each of them distinctly. So um, the first one would be real evil when we call what we call moral evil. So let's explain that one a little bit. So when we talk about moral evil, that is there is an intention behind it. So my uncle's situation is very different from my nephew's situation because my uncle's situation, people had the intention of like punishing a good man, you know, and they, they know that, it, that it, he was gonna suffer when they cut him and they knew that he was gonna, you know, experience ter tremendous pain and, and they wanna keep it like that. That was their intention. So that's evil, we, that, that's awful, right? So that is the real question that, that almost we need to answer. Like, and so why would God allow us human beings to be, to do things like that to one another? And the answer would be, because when God created us, he wanted us to have freedom. So like when we were saying that God allows it, and if he allows it, there must be a better, a good reason that comes, something good that comes out of that, something better that comes out of that. Freedom is the thing in love. So if you want to create something, that is in the image and likeness of God in the sense that beings that can love, truly love, is by definition, you need to give those people freedom. Because, well, you could say, here's a thought experiment. How about if we do it, we're smarter than God. So we might say, let's not give him freedom. How about if there was like a kill switch that, uh, if I'm gonna hurt someone, I like, poop, fall dead. <laughs> so maybe you're walking in the mall and you see somebody falling dead and they're like, ah, what happened? Oh, he must be having you know, murderous thoughts. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so God, God's, you know, the kill switch, you know. God set it up like that. If God had done that, then what would be, what would be the implications for capacity to love and to act freely? then we wouldn't be fully free. And I think over time you would start really questioning in a more serious get way, God's goodness. Because if you think about it, that's like putting you in a cage where all the things you can do is to love. And you, we know that, that if somebody's forcing you to love, that is the opposite of love. Yeah, that, is, that is more similar to abuse, right? So, uh, it's almost like by, by, by the way kind of logical things are, if you want to create beings that are fully able to love, they should also be able to not love. 
if they don't want to. For love to be real, then it needs to be free. So you can't put people in a cage where all they can do is, is give you kisses. So, so if you're gonna make human beings free, there's gonna be pain, there's gonna be evil. So there's kind of like a greater good. God allows it, and we go back to that in theology. God doesn't want it, but God allows it because it's logically impossible not to have it and have people I can love. So God thinks it's worth having a world where people might hurt each other because it's worth having love in the world. Like, it's not like, it's not like God is saying how many you know, instances of love versus how many instances of pain and see, he didn't do that calculation thinking, well, may, I bet they're gonna have more love than, than pain. God did the calculation saying, no, having beings that can love is worth anything. In the end, I'm gonna keep, you know, you know save him from all that, <laughs> but it's worth sharing that love in creation. So that's, uh, that's kind of God's, God's um, and that basically we could say like, what was God ta talking about when he was talking to Job about that? You know, like, where were you when I created the earth? It, it, it could probably say it was something like this. God was allowing some horrible things because it was worth having a world where people could love, people could live and have, share the life of God. So God thought it was worth it. And uh, when we were saying, so, that, that, so when you look at like all the pain in the world, all the evil in the world, there's really two parts. So the first half, or like I would say more like 80% of what's painful in the world is the pain that comes from the sin of others and, and all that with, with a purpose. And then there's like this other percentage that comes from uh, loss, people die in our lives, we get sick, people in our life get sick, and that's difficult. So that percentage, uh, we could say, well, that is not necessarily evil. God allows it because of how he created the world in a way where we're gonna be uh, back to, to himself, but it allows for us to have some distance from God. You know, our world, creating a world where God is not so linked to everything that happens also has to do with freedom, so meaning, God created us as human beings and, and there's some distance that we have from God. The fact that he created a world with its own laws of nature and its own you know, processes that include disease and life and death, what, there is some distance from God. He could have created us within himself, but God would always be around. And then if God is always too close, we might not be so free either, meaning if everything that happens is something that God made it happen, then I'm thinking, well, you know, God, God is watching in a way that you know, it might be scary. But then, but God, God sets up a world where we have total freedom to love him or not to love him, you know, to be with him or not to be with him. And, and, and ultimately, we develop ourselves, and at the end, you know, judgment, we could say it's a time where we come to say, this is what I've been looking for my entire life, when we're face to face with God, or this is what I've been trying to get away from my entire life. And hell, it's a place where God says, if you don't want me to love you, if you want me to leave you alone, I can do that. So it's almost an expression of love for God to say, there's a place where I can just remove myself completely for your life, from your life. And it doesn't have to destroy our soul. So in that sense, hell is not, we don't need to see it as punishment, but as kind of this natural consequence of God creating people that are, that are free to not love. You know? So we want to be with God forever, and stop you know, messing with our bodies and the things that happen, that we can do that in eternity, that's the resurrection of the body. But if 
we just want God to leave us alone forever at the, at the last day, that can be also, you know, done. We represent as fire and, and, and smoke because we think we're not created for that. We think we're created for love, and that is painful. But for somebody that has developed a life where they want to be away from God, maybe that's precisely perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. So from philosophy, the classic question would be, if God is good, then why would God create a world like this? And we could say that basically the problem is in a way with the question. Because they say, if God is good, God would stop evil. So it sounds very simple, right? But it's very black and white. It doesn't, and the answer, like a more full answer is kind of like, there's black and white in there, but it's like a silver color, you know? God allows for evil, but there's gonna be a greater thing that's gonna come out of that, and that's freedom and love, and, and, that's, and it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, it's not a black and white answer, but it's a very complete answer, you know? So, why would God allow us to hurt each other? Because we're creating God's image and likeness, and we're able to love. If there's no freedom, we couldn't have love, and without love, uh, or, or love without freedom would be a jail. So this is kind of like a baseball bat. Freedom is like a baseball bat. You know, God gives us this gift, and a dad giving a, his son a baseball bat hopes, it, the dad hopes that they use it to go play with his friends. But we can use it, but he knows that he can use it to go hit other kids, right? So um, it's a good gift, the gift of freedom, God wants us to use it for love. That's why all in scripture is about using it for the greater good. Uh, you know, defeat evil with goodness. So, uh, so it's a biz, this baseball bat that God gave us. It's a lot of trust, a lot of responsibility. Uh, uh, but we make poor use of it. And it's, uh, it's also like a mother. The, the other thing about pain and suffering, it's kind of like a mother, you know, that a mother knows my child might grow up and have difficulty. He might get sick. He might get beaten up in the playground. Maybe there's gonna be bullies at school. He's gonna have to pay taxes. <laughs> it's gonna be awful. And the mother says, it's worth it. It's worth having a child in the world because it's worth love. It's worth you know, life. It's worth all that. So uh, that's kind of like a mother knows that there will be pain. Like the same way God knows that there's going to be pain when he creates the world. And he says, it's worth it. It's worth having that in the world because it's worth love. And from theology, this is as far as uh, philosophy gets us. But then when you bring in theology, it all connects everything. And it's, and it's like, and not only did I create it like that, but I will not abandon you. And when you go through that, I'll walk through it with you. Let's do it together. You know, let me show you how, and Jesus became man. You know? and, 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 and communion expresses that. I want to be together with you as, you, as, as you're going through it. So it's like mother that doesn't just says, I'm going to bring a child to the world and leave him to his own devices, but will care for the wounds when they come. Will like embrace you know, the difficulties when they come and will cherish uh, the life that, that she's created. So, um, so freedom and love are worth it. And the answer for natural evil, we, we, we said is not really evil in that sense because there is no intention. So like in a hurricane, an earthquake, a disease, you know, they all have their own causes and they're external to God. The real problem we could say in all of those is death. We're gonna die. Disease, the problem with disease is that it's gonna lead us to ultimately die. And, and well, couldn't God create us without death? And with all with this, this, this other things we were saying is logically impossible. So it's logically impossible to create people with a free will and love. And it's logically impossible to create um, people completely separated from God and, uh, and, and, not, and not experience the separation from that kind of life. You know, so the big question is, 
Could God make a burrito so hot he couldn't eat it? That's <laughs> these are uh, questions that are impossible, logical impossibilities. Uh, couldn't God make a round square or a square circle? Yeah, like can God is isn't God able to do anything? Well, uh, those kind of indicate that there's the fact that you can say it doesn't mean that it's a possibility. It's a logical impossibility to have human beings without suffering the effects of death or suffering the effects of, uh, of evil and have, and, and have them make them free and have them make them uh, separated from God. So, so the fact that we have bodies make us separated from God that's a good thing. It gives us freedom, distance from God, and yet uh, it will mean that will end. So we can be with God forever, and that's going to be painful. And some people will go first, and, and I'm going to miss them. Yeah. So it's just, uh, but it doesn't, it is not the last bit. So that uh, the problem of evil in this sense, uh, in the sense of death, disease, and all that, is really a problem of human pain. Like, I'm just gonna miss when my children die. I'm gonna miss when my parents die. I'm gonna, when I lose health, I'm gonna be upset about it. When I, when I struggle, I don't wanna struggle. <laughs> and I mean, that gets us to, to stuff that have to do with spiritual. How does God want to be with me when I go through that so that I can feel his presence, so that I can feel his embrace? So. So that's, we'll wait for the answer from spirituality. It's gonna be a shorter bit. But for now, I just wanna give you uh, a moment of prayer, time to go in the grounds, have a time to, to reflect about this. This is a prayer that uh, you could probably do it in 30 minutes. So let's say we leave at 10.45, uh, sorry, at 10. 15, we can come back uh, at 11, and that way we have 45 minutes. And, and this is a prayer that will guide you through that scripture passage of Martha and Mary, uh, and, and kind of experiencing their loss of their, of their brother. And I think just that, that moment of their loss could really connect with a lot of our attitudes before our losses and our pain. And I'm sure everybody has something to talk about with God related to this. What's been the most recent loss you've had? Or what's been a painful thing in your life that maybe is worth bringing to God? And because I think these type of things are good to pray with, Martha and Mary give us, a, and the relationship they have with Jesus, give us a model. Because Martha and Mary, first, are very honest with Christ about it. So I think to see that and to learn from them so that I can be honest when it happens, the answer when we're experiencing pain is not to say, it's not there, it's not there, it's not there, I'm gonna think positive, think positive. <laughs> I think the answer is to be able to be honest with God about that and, and to know that God wants to embrace you and counter you there. So this will guide you through the Ignatian form of uh, contemplation. We do this a lot in the retreats. Um, you can, um, the scripture passages in the beginning, and it will guide you on how to do it. I'm not gonna say too much more, but uh, ultimately it's that you see how Jesus interacts with Martha and Mary, and that you see how maybe Jesus wants to talk to you about your loss, and maybe just be with you, share that. So just, uh, I'll pass this around. And, and this is a prayer that will guide you through that scripture passage of Martha and Mary uh, and, and kind of experiencing their loss of their, of their brother. And I think just that, that moment of their loss could really connect with a lot of our attitudes before our losses and our pain. And I'm sure everybody has something to talk about with God 
related to this? You know, what's been the most recent loss you've had? Or what's been a painful thing in your life that maybe is worth bringing to God? And because I think these type of things are good to pray with, Martha and Mary give us a, and the relationship they have with Jesus, give us a model. Because Martha and Mary first are very honest with Christ about it. So I think to see that and to learn from them so that I can be honest when it happens, the answer when we're experiencing pain is not to say, it's not there, it's not there, it's not there, I'm gonna think positive, think positive. <laughs> I think the answer is to be able to be honest with God about that and, and to know that God wants to embrace you and encounter you there. So this will guide you through the Ignatian form of uh, contemplation. We do this a lot in the retreats. Um, you can, um, the scripture passages in the beginning, and it will guide you on how to do it. I'm not gonna say too much more, but uh, ultimately it's that you see how Jesus interacts with Martha and Mary, and that you see how maybe Jesus wants to talk to you about your loss, and maybe just be with you, share that. So just, uh, I'll pass this around. He lets them, and I think that's so beautiful and so important because God wants to hear the honest parts of ourselves. God is not destroyed by that. God can handle our pain. <laughs> In fact, Jesus himself does that. Why does Martha and Mary can do it? Because they're friends. <coughs> and Jesus does that also with the Father because they're, they have a deep relationship. So Jesus says to the Father, Father, can you take this away from me? I'll, I'll do it, but if it could, <laughs> it'd be better. <laughs> uh, and then when he's in the cross, he also says some unspeakable things. Father, why have you forsaken me? That's another place where we might want to correct Jesus. It's like, no, 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 Jesus. It's like, don't say that. <laughs> but Father, why? do you realize there's a, there's a strange thing about that, that Jesus saying that. He's saying to the Father, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus, in, in his heart, he knows that the Father is listening, but he's saying to the Father, I cannot feel you right now. But he's saying it to the Father. And I think this is so important for us because when we experience pain, like Jesus, we might not be able to feel God's presence so closely. And the invitation is to know that he's there, even if we can't feel it so much. You know, so, so one way to address that situation of distance and is to say it, to speak it. I have your forsaken me. If you had been here, this would not have happened, you know? like put the things on the table and that allows God to talk to us about it and to be with us in that. Some people say that honesty with God is not that important because God knows everything. So why would I say to God that I feel like this because he knows it, you know? And I think it only makes sense in the sense of our relationship. It's not about knowledge, it's about a relationship. So um, here's an example. When I was three years old, it was the first time the teachers got serious about grading, <laughs> and I failed a bunch of classes. I failed like a couple of subjects, and my mom, the day that grades were due, my mom picked me up. And she knew that grades were due. And she could read in my face. I was defeated and, <laughs> and saddened, you know, with a hunchback, you know, walking with my... And so she, when I, when I came into the car, I just kind of threw the backpack in there. I got in there and she asked me, so, how, how did the day go? <laughs> did she need to ask me? She knew it. <coughs> she could see it and I could read a mile away. And I said, Fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Are you sure you want to talk about it? 
No, it's good. Normal day. And we went home in silence. Yeah. And and so if you think about it, that's a little bit what can happen with God. You know, God might know what's going on. God knows how our heart might be broken. God knows our struggles. But if we don't want to talk about it, uh, we we might not let God in. He wants to be a part of it, but talking about it is opening up a relationship. It's opening up the subject. It's letting God into that. Thank God. Later on, my mom, I guess, I talked to my father about that, and then at dinner, my dad can ask again. So, how's the day go? I looked at my mom, and she knew that I said no, and I started crying. And I said, I failed the math and this, and. And it was a beautiful experience because that moment allowed them to come close to me and give me a hug, both of them. And then we started working on that together. And then it was like, don't worry, we're gonna get you a tutor. We're gonna uh, work with you. It's gonna be fine. And it was fun. I made it. Yeah. So what was the difference between one interaction and the other? They both, both times they knew what was going on, but the second one, I had the chance of keeping distance, but me allowing that vulnerability allowed my parents to come and, and hug me and talk about that. You know? And that's what God wants to do with us. So prayer and spirituality is, is the way we have, you know, where we can connect with God and, and, and open parts of our heart that, that might be, you know, a little injured or a little that they're suffering, they're struggling, and bring that into God's light, you know, and love. And and that's kind of what Jesus did with Martha and Mary. And he cares about us. And he wants to hear the raw things. And when we say it, it puts it on the table and lets God, you know, embrace us. With Martha and Mary, he cares about it. And he and sometimes there's not much to say. With Martha and Mary, it's just weep with them. Sometimes we like God to we would like God to fix it real quick. And it's almost like God is more interested in in sharing that with us first. So Martha, if you noticed in the passage, immediately goes to, but you're the resurrection of the life and everything's gonna be okay, right? Right, right? <laughs> and Jesus says, Tell me more, yeah. <laughs> they talk about the resurrection and, but he doesn't go fix it, you know? And then Mary, she tells him that and he and they and they basically ask him, Show me where you laid them. They go to the tomb and it smells bad. But it's at that point where it smells bad, where, where all that raw feeling stuff come up, where Jesus, before going to fix anything, he shares that with us. And so she weeps and Jesus, and Jesus wept. You know? So that's a, it's the shortest verse in scripture. And it's almost also the most beautiful. It's marked as the shortest because it's so important. It shows Jesus humanity, Jesus desired to share our struggles you know, and how what's God's position before pain. That's it. Jesus sometimes it's not a lot of words that God wants to say. Sometimes it's not a miracle. We would like God to come fix it with a miracle real quick. And and sometimes it's just that God wants to weep with us. And wouldn't that you know be a lot of times more important? There's uh it can't get it up on the I don't know what's happening with the projection, but uh, there's a um, quote from um, John McMurray. And, uh, it was a quote that uh, a Jesuit, uh, Bill Berry, used to use a lot. He was uh, a famous spiritual director. And it was a quote uh, about the distinction between true religion and false religion. And it said that, False religion says, trust in God and everything you fear will not happen to you. So it's like magic. If you trust in God, God will fix it. But it's false and it doesn't really happen like that. Yeah. And, it's, and if it, the proponents of false religion will say, well, you didn't have faith enough. You didn't pray hard enough. You, maybe you're sinning still. Maybe you need to do more. Yeah. But it's kind of ultimately it's a false fix. You know, it's trying to get God to fix it, you know. So false religion says, trust in God and everything you fear will not happen to you. It says, true religion says, trust in God 
everything you fear might still happen to you, <laughs> but it's nothing to be afraid of. And that is the message of true religion. It's nothing to be afraid of. You will not have the last word. God will be with you. And, and ultimately, that will not define you. Yeah. So this is kind of when we get a sense that we can talk to God about our pain, about our suffering, about our loss. We bring that to the table and, and we get a sense that there's a wider perspective, that God can be with us there, that God can help us come out of the other end with hope, that God can turn this into something that we don't know what it will be, but there's going to be life at the end of that. It doesn't need to be the thing that, that defines our life.